All right, let's kick it off, guys. Zillow Flex training today is Thursday, January 13th for our weekly Zillow Flex training. Uh, we're going to go over uh, just our progress update with our growth advisor, how we're And then I'm going to kind of train on um, a topic that was kind of brought to my attention to help us convert these leads at a higher level. So let's kick it off real quick. I'm going to share my screen and share the notes with you from our meeting with our growth advisor. Um, so let's see, just a couple updates. The ones that apply to you guys, uh, making sure all the the agents on the flex team have completed the flex agreement. So if you guys remember when you signed up for Zillow flex, you had to go in there and click a link and DocuSign like a, an agreement. A lot of you guys have done that, but if there's anybody who hasn't done that yet, we need to make sure that it's done ASAP. So if you can reach out to me, um, send me a message or even just put it in the chat here. If you haven't went onto Zillow, click the link and done your DocuSign, for the Zillow Flex Agreement, we need to have all of those on file because uh, they're starting to audit everyone. Um, one of the next things is our, just a reminder that our new campaign is gonna start pretty soon. So we're gonna be updating our roster by tomorrow, uh, which means we're gonna go through and kind of see who's gonna be on Flex receiving leads directly. I did get all your text messages from last week to kind of see who can handle flex. And then I'm checking in with your squad leaders to see who will be the ones on the front end handling the calls. And then who will be the ones kind of on the back end assisting um, the other agents to help, you know, close these clients. Um, we're going to also be updating zip codes. Um, I have to up update those by Monday. If anybody has a specific zip code, that they want to see if we can get leads in, um, send me a message as well on a, on a specific zip code. Keep in mind though, if it's like, a, a, um, if it's a zip code where we only have one person that could cover that zip code, then we're probably not going to do it. We have to, it has to be something that's serviceable by at least a handful of people. Um, because let's say you get a call from that, that zip code and you're busy and you don't answer the call. If there's no one else, servicing that zip code, that lead will get lost and it'll go to another team. So they always want us to choose zip codes where we're gonna have at least a handful of agents covering. So when you send me a zip code, it has to be something that's serviceable. And we're trying to keep things here like in the immediate Silicon Valley where it's you know easy to drive there from our office. Um, so just keep that in mind. And then our new campaign um, with all these updates will launch on the 26th of this month. And it's not really going to change much for you guys, but just keeping you informed that this is the new campaign and our report card basically is re getting reset for this new campaign. So it's going to go from January to April, beginning of April is when our next report card will be pulled. Um, so that's when they grade us on how we performed for that campaign and then they decide if they're going to keep our leads the same bring them up or down. Now, one of the updates um, that I got just this morning or yesterday, we ended our last campaign at 83%, which was not too good. Um, that put us below par, but Zillow Flex had announced a few months back that if you have best of Zillow status, because when they survey the clients, if the clients are giving us five-star reviews and good ratings, if you earn the best of Zillow status, that would give you a 10% bump on your percent to market. So we have best of Zillow status. So our campaign uh, went from an 83 and now it's at a 94 because they added 10% more because we had best of Zillow. So that kicked in, they reassessed their campaign um, so our grade for the last campaign was a 94%, which now puts us kind of in that moderate to good, I believe. Um, so that's good news, guys. It's good news that now um, our grade was reevaluated and we're not below par. We're actually like right in the middle, which was where we're supposed to be. So it's not like a strike against us. 
So um, moral of the story, guys, is obviously Zillow cares about our performance. They care about us converting. That's, you know, the bottom line. But at the same time, they do care about the customer satisfaction, what those customers are experiencing when they call in. And that's why they're servicing, they're surveying the clients. And so they're grading it off the surveys, they're grading it off the performance, all those things. And that's where you get that best of Zillow status. So because you guys are handling these calls well, and you guys are giving people good customer service, that kicked in and that helped us push our grade up. Um, our current percent to market says 78, but I don't think that's accurate because there's a few transactions that just went in in the last week. It's saying we only had one, but I think there's a couple more that happened in this last week. So we're probably somewhere like in the high 80s or low 90s right now. So I'm gonna just change this. I'm gonna say 88 or so. Because this is grading it as of uh, as of Friday, guys. It didn't count for anything we put into some from Saturday until today. Exactly. Yeah, maybe let's get a, um, who had a Zillow Flex in contract in this last week? I think a couple of you guys, I think, I don't know, Brian, Aaron. We did, but ours was, was, uh, ours was Thursday, I believe. Last Thursday? Yeah. And then I think Brian got another one in this week. Okay, were there any more that went in this week? Yeah, I'm not too sure. Um, okay. Um, but either way, our score is a little bit higher. It, it didn't track those those ones that came in within the last few days or whatever. So um, the moral story, guys, is we have some time, right? Like we have to perform. So we have from now until April to just maintain that pace. You know, if we're getting, a you know, one or two in contract every single week, that's going to put us on that healthy pace to be performing above average and continue to be in good standing with Zillow Flex and possibly even um, – you know, if we're performing above average and they'll decide if they want to give us even more leads right now, I think I'm not too worried about getting more leads right now. Uh, my concern is making sure we're handling the leads that we have, because I know we have a, a pipeline that we've been building as well over the last, you know, six months since we got on flex. There's a lot of people who put things on hold for the holidays who are now coming back out. And then just keep in mind that that percent to market again, that's the last six months. So any leads they gave you within six months, that's how they're grading you. They're essentially giving you a lead and they're giving you six months to perform with that lead to get it in contract, which is a lot of time. And that counts towards your percent to market. So um, you guys got to make sure you're revisiting all your nurtures. Everyone who's been in the nurture over the last few months, going back to the um, you're getting the hot ones that are coming in, but we got to also not disregard anything that came in within the last you know six months because those could count those can be production obviously and commissions and pay but those also will count towards our performance with zillow flex to to remain in good standing are there any questions just about that first part how that all works our new campaign how the grading works feel free to put it in the chat or unmute yourself if you want and any questions during this conversation, feel free to put in the chat and I'll check the chat and try to answer those. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go back to our screen over here. And we have what's called the team member scorecard. Zoom in on this a little bit so we can see it a little bit better. So this is a snapshot of the last 30 days. This is... Uh, this is basically what has happened over the last 30 days with the leads that you've gotten in the last 30 days. So we can see right here um, how many connections have been given out. Like Brian got 42 connections, George had 30. You can kind of go down the list and see how many connections were, were distributed out. And that also correlates with the answer rate, right? So some of you guys are getting your phones ringing, but you may not be answering. If you look overall, you know, this, this included a lot of December. The answer rates seem pretty low, 22%, 19%, 11 47 
the highest answer rate in the last 30 days was Tony, 47%. Um, which, you know, we got to improve that going forward. I know we had holidays, some people got sick. So there's, you know, there were some external factors happening as well. Uh, some people were traveling, you know, stuff like that. But going forward, you know, that now that we're back in business, you know, rocking and rolling for the new year, we got to get this answer rate up because the more you answer, the more opportunity you're going to get. From those answers, we start looking at appointment rate and you can see anything in green, you know, you're performing above par um, for appointment rate. Anything in the red or yellow, that's where we need improvement. So like Aaron, we have a 35% appointment rate for you. We got to get that up. Part of this also, guys. I'm sorry. Hold on real quick. Uh, part of this also is making sure that you are getting credit for your work. Because remember, all of these, these numbers, uh, answer rate, that's tracked by you answering your phone. But appointment rate, met with you know, all these other metrics, these are directly coming from you updating the statuses in Zillow. So if you booked an appointment with someone and you didn't check it as appointment booked, you're not getting credit for that. And therefore your score is lower. And the only thing we can judge it off of is your score. All right. So, um, you know, just reiterating that it's your responsibility to make sure you're updating this because we have some that are, are pretty low. There's just a handful, right? And these are the ones that need to be worked on. Um, Aaron, what was your question? I'm sorry. Um, so if, when you're like updating status, if you go from like spoke with customer down to showing homes and you don't click like set appointment or anything, does that not count? Um, it will count. It will count as, um, it, it will count as an appointment if you met with them to show homes. So it will count. Um, but just to be on, on the safe side, I would change it to appointment. And then I would always do update the status after it happens, right? So if you book the appointment, update the status after you book the appointment. If you go show them homes, go back and update the status saying that you showed them homes. Now, a big, one of the things that came out or uh, that came to our attention was just clarifying met, met, uh, met with customer versus showing homes. Right. And try, trying to make sure that we're, we're being a little more uh, accurate on that, because you can if it was like a one and done, like they called, you booked an appointment to go see one, two, three Main Street. You met them there right on that initial property that they requested. You open the door and then you never heard from them after they ghosted you. I would just count that as met with customer. But if you're actively showing homes to somebody like, okay, you showed them that home, then you want to show them some more. Now you guys have another appointment to go see homes. That would be more showing homes, right? But if it's just, you met with them on that initial one, and then that's all that happened, I would just leave that as met, met with customer. And that's what our growth advisor recommended because then what it does is it kind of skews our, our data. If you're changing every single one to showing homes when you only met them for that one property, then what we're thinking is like, hey, you're, you're actively showing homes to all of these people. How come you're not writing offers for them? But then you're like, oh, well, well I only showed them that one and then they ghosted me or, or they are getting approved or whatever, right? So, you know, this is now where we're going a little bit deeper and just trying to fine tune so that we can have a good gauge of, of who the hot ones are and who the ones that are more nurturers and stuff like that. So just to reiterate that, if you only met them on that one first initial property and, and you didn't show them any homes after that, or you're not in the process of showing them homes, just leave it as met with customer for that one. If you're now actively showing them homes and you're, you're two or other properties, other than that, just one, now you're showing them homes, right? That's more of a, a solid showing them homes. So just differentiate those two uh, statuses. So, so, so Kike, I got a, I got a quick question then. Mm -hmm. So, because um, my conversion rate, it's pretty damn good, right? But what's happening is I'm meeting with them at the house. They don't like it. And then I set the appointment and then I change it back to appointment set. So I go from appointment set to appointment met 
They don't like the house because, but then I schedule it to a Zoom meeting and then I bring it back to an appointment set. That was my question too, is um, if they stop looking, basically, do you go back? If you're showing homes and they stop looking, you go just put it back to Met? Because I know there was an issue of going backwards with me um, in the past. So yeah, like, I'm, I'm good. I wouldn't I'm go good. backwards, guys. I well, wouldn't go again? backwards. I wouldn't go backwards. Um, I would just leave it on Met. And then if it, let's say nothing happens, that now should be a nurture. You should just put it as a nurture because now you're still continuing to follow up and try to make something happen with them. Okay. Um, that's what I would do. I would, I would really try to simplify the categories and like anything who's hot showing homes, you're showing them homes, anybody who you're still trying to get a hold of and all that after that initial conversation or whatever, or that initial showing, that's like a nurture pipeline where you're still trying to follow up. So that's what I would just kind of try to use those as those two simple. I wouldn't keep going back and forth, back and forth. And you don't get any extra credit for doing that. And it just makes your life a little harder. So yeah, I'm you, wondering if the stats would be remember because that. of that, right? No, it's not. It's only going to count at that one time. So remember, once you change it to appointment set, it logs it as an appointment. But if you go to met, it logs it as a met. But if you go back to appointment set, it doesn't log you as another appointment set, right? It's just one time for that client. So it's not going to skew the numbers, you know? So you're not doing any favors or you're not getting any extra credit by moving it back and forth. You might just be confusing yourself a little bit more. So I would try to, I would try to just move them down and then decide, is this a active one that I'm showing homes to, or is it now a nurture that I got a more follow-up on? Um, and then you can move them from nurture back to showing homes, maybe, right? Let's say you nurture that and now it's an active showing homes, then maybe in that case you do that. But I think it's going to get real confusing if you're like met, set, it, it, it starts getting a little confusing. Um, okay, so hopefully that answers some of you guys' questions. Let's go back to this chart here. Um, and as you see, guys, it it starts trickling down, right? This is the sales funnel, right? So you book the appointments, then you start meeting with people, right? The more appointments you book, the more you meet with. Now, a lot of times you guys are meeting with them and you're not tracking that you met with them, but they're just staying in appointment set status, right? So you gotta, once again, you gotta continue to just update your statuses and move it down the line. Um, you know, and then from met, it goes to offer rate. So the big disconnect that we're seeing, and this is something we're gonna talk about today, is our met to offer rate. So let's look, let's look at an example. I'm going to pick on Tony real quick. Um, Tony had an 80% appointment rate, which was awesome. Out of those 80%, he met with, and this is based off the of 20 connections, right? So he had 20 connections, 80% he booked appointments with. So eight times two is what, 16, right? So so he booked appointments with 16. Um, he met with 50% of his connections, right? So it's all based off the connections. So he met with 10 of them. And then he has a 5% offer rate. So that means out of the, uh, the 20 connections, 5%, that means he's writing offers for one of them. So what I'm looking at is Tony met with 10 you know, and we don't know if he's still showing them homes or what's happening or are they getting pre-approved or whatever, but he wrote off, he's wrote offers for one, right? And this is where we got to sharpen up right here. How do we get people going from the met with, you know, whether you meet with them or you're showing them homes or whatever in that status to getting them to the offer table, right? And that's, that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, and this is just a 30 day snapshot, right? The next chart is the, the lifetime snapshot since we started in flex, you know, so the numbers start to average out a little bit more, as you can see, um, the offer rates start to get a little bit higher, but there's no one in here that is consistently in the green. I got Harold that's in the green, but that's also because Harold's only had four connections. So his, his data sample size is, is smaller. But when we look at these guys who have had have who have had a lot of connections, these ones at the top, you can see offer rates are are kind of low. They're all in the red. Some of them have zero. Like I'm gonna pick on Maori right 
right here. 59 connections, 24%, zero offers. So I don't know, Maori, have you written any offers for any Zillow Flex or have you, did you just not update it? No, right, right now, the ones that I do have actively looking from Zillow Flex, um, they're, they took a break during the holidays and they're just bouncing back now. So we are actively showing them. Okay. okay. A lot of these were like land stuff too that I connected that just never happened. Okay, so this is where we got to look at, right? The met with to offer rate. And then let's look at this funnel down here. So this funnel is a snapshot of our whole pipeline, but it also compares us on the right-hand side. This is what the top 10% of teams in our current market are doing. And then this is what we're doing, right? And this is overall, since we've got on flex, and they, they pulled this report a couple of days ago. So as of a couple of days ago, we have gotten 977 connections, which is a lot. We booked 76% appointments. So we booked 745 appointments, 43% we met with, 425. And then you see right here, we have 248 as showing homes. Out of those 248, only 58 were submitting offers. And only 20 of them we got in contract and closed. We closed 16 so far. Right, so our conversion rate at the bottom, the bottom number is our, is our I guess, under contract. We got a 2% conversion rate. And that's what they look at when they count the percent to market is once you get it under contract. The top 10% of our teams are on average are doing 4% or more, and we're at a 2%. You know, so part of it is what I look at here is like, hey, we've, we've gone in and put that we're showing homes at 248 people. You know, that means out of those 248, we've only written offers for 58 of them. There's a big disconnect here. So the question is, and that's why we, we talked about trying to track these numbers more accurately. Like, did we just only meet with them on the initial one? Or are we showing homes? Because what I see is like, if we're showing homes at 248 people actively showing homes to, there should be a lot more offers being written. Right. Or maybe we, we're not showing homes to this many people. Maybe we only log that in as that initial one that we met with them. And, and now they're, you know, we, we log that as showing homes, but it's not like an active person that we're showing homes to. So this is the data. And then this is our data overall for all the leads we have in the pipeline. There's still nine of them that say new. There's 18 of them that say spoke with customer. Uh, two that say attempted contact. So remember right here, like these three categories, they should not stay in that category. These need to be moved. If you spoke with them, what happened? Did you book an appointment? If the answer is no, then that needs to be a nurture now. Then that's someone that you're trying to follow up with. So this number needs to, these ones need to get out of here. Attempted contact. Does that mean you call? They didn't answer. So these two, if they're not answering, then they need to be moved to nurture. Or if it's like just a completely wrong number or they're not, you know, someone that's active, decide if we're going to reject them. Because as of now, we have 531 nurtures right now. Um, there's 72 that are marked as showing homes. And there's 13 that are marked as submitting offers. And that's the current pipeline as of right now. Right now. He, uh, Enrique, what, what does, what do yeah. they think, uh, our manager, what do they think about our rejected numbers? Do they make any comments about that or do they want to dive deeper into it? Because I, I feel like when, when, when we get over, uh, overwhelmed with these leads and other lead sources in the past, like we're kind of scared to reject them. Just wanted to get their feedback to see if, if, if they made any comments about that. About the rejection. Oh, they don't care. They've told us like, if it's a completely dead lead, like there's no way that person's going to buy They're They just don't qualify. They don't make money. Or maybe it was a wrong number. Maybe it was an agent. Or maybe it was a, yeah. they call by mistake. Then it just reject it. But we got to just make sure we're not rejecting things that should be a nurture. If someone has an agent, that's not a reject. That's a nurture. That means, Hey, you have an agent. Great. You know, um, I'm already out here showing homes. Let me get you into the home and we'll go from there. 
if the client says, no, you know, I, I want to work with my agent. Okay, not a problem. You know, the market's pretty competitive. Can I follow up with you in a few weeks, you know, and see how you're doing? That's a nurture, right? So I don't see, I think in my opinion, there would be only like a couple instances where you're going to reject something. But if it's a true reject, then just reject it. You know, not a big deal, but just make sure we're not rejecting leads that just need follow-up, right? Uh, I know sometimes we have those BMRs and all those different things. So, you know, maybe they don't qualify at all completely, you know, so those could be a reject, but also that means you got to ask the right questions to see if maybe what do they qualify for? Um, so I'm going to go, I'm going to do a little bit of training next um, on just kind of some strategy and some discussion around going from showing homes or met with to getting some offers submitted. But I did want to bring something up. Jason, when we, we emailed Andrew asking about our growth advisor asking about referral fees, right? Yes. And my impression was that if we, um, I initially thought if we refer something over to someone we got to still pay zillow flex off the top and then but the way it made it seem and this i'm going to clarify this with them is that we can refer a deal over to another agent and zillow only takes their cut off of what we make was that kind of what he said that that's what it looked like in the email enrique right you know i forgot to ask when we met with him yesterday but that's what he put in writing he said that they that zillow will take Put in the, the amount that we received and Zillow will take that, that their 35% from there. Yeah, so I'm, I want to clarify, clarify that with him. I'm going to send him a, a, an email today or try to call him. But that, that actually opens up more avenues for us because that was some of the questions that you guys had asked. I think Aaron asked on, a, on the last one. If we refer, let's say someone outside of our area, they want to look in Fresno, um, it looks like we may be able to refer it to that agent in Fresno and we can take our referral fee so we can negotiate that, right? Let's say we get a 30% referral fee from them and then Zillow is going to take their percentage off of what we get paid, right? So that allows us to do more deals that way and, and those deals still count towards our conversion and our percent to market. Um, so that, I didn't know we can do that. I'm gonna, I, I gotta double check. Cause usually with most other lead sources like Redfin or OpCity, if they refer it to you, they don't want you referring it out to someone else. But I think Zillow might, might not care. They just care about getting the deal done. Um, does that mean- uh, So I'll clarify that guys today and then I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys know. Does that mean that uh, Zillow is basically- Go ahead. 30, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Basically, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, does that mean Zillow is taking 35% of our admin fee for every transaction too? Because that's getting added to the gross commission that we receive, right? Yeah. They take they take 30 they take their percentage off of the gross, right? So the admin fee is just added on as extra commission. Yeah. So they get their percentage of the admin fee as well. I have a I have a question about the referrals. Yeah. So um, you're saying like if we get a Zillow Flex from, you know, like Fresno or, or wherever, um, and then we refer it out, the only way we would be able to get Fresno leads in the first place was if we added Fresno zip codes, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. But sometimes you have a client <laughs> that inquires here, but maybe they don't qualify and they want to look in another area. Um, it's not always, right? But I there's do, a couple circumstances got it i have a i have a question to add to that one um I have some some of the leads on there they're looking like other states we could sort of yeah them, right and it's still it's still going yeah, with sure somebody yeah so we can refer it to another state right let's say they're looking in texas we refer it to a texas agent we ask that agent for 35 percent referral fee and then Zillow is going to get their 30% off of our 35%. Yeah. Right. So they're going to get a cut of what we actually receive. Got it. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to clarify yeah, this for you guys, because that's what it seemed like. 
but it, it will open up more avenues, right? So that we can start referring stuff out if we need to, and we can still make a little piece and then Zillow makes their piece as well. And this, these referrals add up, you know, and a it, lot of you guys have done counts, referrals to other people. Enrique, and then it also accounts to our market, right? It also accounts on our scoring. So that's why it's beneficial as well. Yes. Yeah, because you'll still want to um, you'll still want to manage that lead in your uh, pipeline, and you'll want to change it to under contract when it does get accepted, like in Texas, let's say, right? And then that counts towards our percent to market, so that bumps our score up. You know, so you know that I know that's been a gray area that we were wondering on. Um, so we're gonna I'm gonna look I'm gonna find out today on on that. Okay, let's move on, guys. I'm going to just spend a couple minutes on this and then we'll wrap up. Um, we're recording this. All right, let's see. So I want to open up some discussion on, well, let's start with, let's start here. Um, what are some of the reasons you think clients are not submitting offers? Like you meet with someone, you show them homes, and then they're not submitting offers. Right, because that's the big disconnect we're having. We're showing people homes, but our offer rate is low. Right. So give me some reasons. Type it in the chat. What are some objections you're facing on why people are viewing homes with you and then they're not submitting an offer? Okay, Tony wrote down inventory. There's not enough inventory. Maybe they don't see what they like, right? Or they're looking in a specific neighborhood. Realizing the reality of the market. After we view the homes, we see the comps and the prices are a lot higher than expected because of inventory. Some of my leads are not pre-qualified. Yes, expectation. They don't want to overpay. Anybody else? They just don't like the house. Okay. Okay. Those are good. Those are some good things that we're going to discuss. If anybody else has any more, just type them in the chat. Why are, why do you think, or what are some of the reasons you've encountered where you're showing homes to someone actively showing homes and they don't want to make off, submit offers. Some agents list way below market price and mislead them. Won't shift to townhouse from SFR. Okay, so good stuff. This is this is good feedback, and this is good stuff to talk about. What I'm seeing, guys, is unrealistic expectations. So now, what we got to ask ourselves is: out of these reasons, why? Which ones can we directly affect? Which ones are we in control of? And which ones are completely out of our control, right? If they're out of our control, there's nothing we can do. But there's many of these reasons on here that are in our control to deal with before we go out and start showing a bunch of homes. I got underqualified for the type of property they want after we get down to the nitty gritty, okay. Um, Zahara raised her hand. Um, got Zahara. One thing that I do um, on like a second phone call, because um, obviously we're not trying to create obstacles when we first talk to them because the phone calls being recorded, whatever, um, is setting those expectations up front. Just like, hey, I know you wanted to stay under 1.4 per our conversation. This house is going to sell for like 1.7. Do you really want to take a look at this or should I send you some other options? you know, that are going to fall within your price point. And then also that segues me into setting the Zoom call so that we can go over all the things that they don't know, because clearly they need the education once I start pointing those things out, then it opens their eyes. Like maybe they don't know everything. There we go. So Zahara hit it right on the nose is I set the expectations up front. 
And this, this right here is now going to be the next level for some of you guys here, right? Is we're, we're setting the appointment, you know, we're answering the call. We got the script down. We're setting the appointment. That's the easy part, honestly, right? It's, it's easy to set the appointments because they already have a home they want to see. But what happens after that, right? After we go out there and show them homes and stuff like that. And that's really where the expectations need to be set. Because what the last thing you want to do is, you know, meet with someone, go out and show them a bunch of homes. And then they don't write, want to write an offer because we didn't have a conversation with them. Those hard conversations about where the market's at, where it's going and what's realistic their situation, right? That is 1000% in your control. It's 1000% in your control of you explaining these things and setting those expectations up front. So I, this is something that we need to tweak and implement immediately is you guys need to start not having any fear of losing the client, but have fear of wasting a bunch of your time and wasting a bunch of the client's time only to get down to realize that they can't afford this property, right? That's the fear you should have. Because the, our job, you know, obviously is to service these clients, but our job at the end of the day is to get them a home, is to advise them and to get them a home if they qualify, if they are prepared to participate in this market, if they are prepared to compromise, right? So if you are not having this, conver this, this conversation up front, you know, maybe, maybe you meet them at that first house, right? We're using, we're using the Zillow Flex to get the call to come in. We're getting them to meet with us on that first initial home. So that's like the marketing aspect, right? That's how the lead came in and that's how you got in front of them. But once you're in front of them, you need to now dictate what you're saying to these clients and how well you are explaining the market to them and setting the expectations. And the clients are going to value you so much more if you have the conversation with them when you meet with them. Because you're going to say, hey, you're going to show your authority. You're going to show your leadership. You're going to show that you really care about their interest and their time. Um, you know, so you have to explain these things to them and you have to show them the data. You have to show them, you know, you have to talk about your stories, right? Like, hey, I just helped the client buy a home. There was 30 offers that we went up against. The home was listed at this price. This is what it ended up selling for. Guys, you know, my job is to make sure you fully understand what the market's doing because the last thing I want to do is waste your time or set unrealistic expectations with you. I want to make sure that I'm bringing value to you and you're getting the most, you know, accurate information. You know, so client, Mr. Client, Mrs. Client, do you understand that? First of all, do you understand the nature of the market? Are you prepared to go through this process to get a home? You got to ask those questions and you got to, you got to establish kind of the, the ground rules, right? Like, Hey, if we're going to go in this together, this is what we're going up against. Right. So I just, I'm not trying to scare you, but I want to prepare you so that when we, when I have to come back and ask you to increase your price, or I have to ask you to remove a contingency, or I have to ask you to compromise on the property because maybe it, it doesn't check all, all your boxes, but it checks, you know, nine out of 10 of them. This is why, right? It's a lot easier to have that conversation after you've already done your job of preparing them than to try to autumn at the end when you're trying to submit the offer and you're trying to convince them why they need to come up in their price, but you never had that conversation up front. Then what it sounds like is, hey, you're just trying to get me to spend more money, right? Then the clients think, oh, you're just trying to close me. You're just trying to sell me on it. Uh, Maori, what, what was your input or your question? Um, so my input was that basically, um, and I actually had this conversation with Manny because we had a client who had unrealistic expectations. Um, and I had the same thing with Manny. I was like, hey, man, we have to have these hard conversations. And that's what's going to set you apart from the rest. Um, again, you're, they're not going to get mad at you for telling the reality. Um, so I had a conversation with a client like that. And I said, hey, Mr. Buyer, look, I know you want this home. Um, I took this from Jason where it's like, in order to live in this neighborhood, these are the prices you have to pay based on, you know, what we see with the market going. Um, and just like you said, he, he definitely, um, he, he was kind of taken back by it. He's like, are you serious? This is really what it has to be. And I said, yes, in order to live in these neighborhoods, this, this is what you have to do. Um, but at the end of the day, he respected us more 
for not wasting his time and being very realistic with him. And I said, Hey, listen, I don't want to bump heads with you. Um, I just want to set a realistic expectation for you. I don't want to sugarcoat anything or give you false hope. This is what it is. How do you feel about it? And then, you know, it kind of gave him time to think about it. And then he got more realistic and now he's working on, you know, something that's more in his price range based on what we said. But I think, um, cause realizing the reality of the market, these are buyers who just, they're online, they see a house, they love it. They see the price and they don't know, right. We're the professionals. So that, that being said, like we're the ones I use these as uh, educational, right? Like I had tried to educate them before on the market and then say, you know, how do you feel? Are you comfortable with that? Yes. Okay. Let's move forward. If not, let's see where you are comfortable and it saves me time. It saves them time. Um, and I don't know, I feel like they respect you more as an agent and there's more credibility there as opposed to showing homes and then telling them later, yeah, you're not going to get your offer accepted. Like I already prepped them ahead of time before we even see the home. Um, and it's been, uh, again, we're qualified buyers that way uh, from my experience. Um, you know, and then also yeah. Danny, he was able to see that part um, and me in action. Yeah, guys, this goes, back, great... this goes back to the conversation that we were having yesterday when Blanca and I were doing the training, guys, is, is let's, let's, let's try to work on getting rid of all the fluff, right? People respect people when you have a straightforward conversation with them, regardless if it hurts or not, right? So it's everything is, everything, even the bad parts could be respected, even if it's said professionally, right? So having that, that, that conversation with your clients and getting rid of it. Oh yeah, I can get somebody in contract in 30 days or I can do better. Like, like let's get away from that kind of stuff and just have a serious conversation because I think people can read that kind of stuff. Right. Um, it'd be a lot better guys if you guys under promised and over delivered. So, so keep that in mind moving forward, because as we spoke about this, about this yesterday, guys is, you know, I'm seeing a lot of that fluff happening. Let's cut back on the fluff, just have a conversation and people will respect you guys. All right. Yeah, it actually hurts you to fluff things up, right? Um, like, here's the thing is make yourself the superhero, right? If if you come in and you you say like, hey, guys, we're going up against the battle, but you know what? I'm on your side. This is my experience. These are my connections. This is how we're going to use the tools that we have to give you the best opportunity. But you know what? I, I need to be honest with you. The neighborhood you're looking in is super competitive. There's not a lot of offers. Homes are typically going way over. This is this is what we're seeing. Um, I want to set you know prepare you for that up front before we even go out there and, and kind of go through this. But if you take my advice and you listen to me, I'm going to get you the best shot of getting a home this year, right? I'm not like other agents that are going to you know promise you the moon and the stars. So I hope you can respect that. Um, I want to advise you. I want to be your consultant and your advisor. And when you start using these words, right? Like I want to be your advisor, your consultant, and you speak like that powerfully, your credibility goes up dramatically and you put the client at a decision, right? The client's going to say, okay, I respect that. Let's go for it. Let's try it out. Or you know what? I thank you for being honest with me. Maybe now is not the right time. You know, I can't afford to pay 200 grand over asking, right? Or whatever it might be, you know? and you you rip the band-aid off early on and you put them out of decision and then the ones that are still want to move forward those are the ones you give all your time and effort and energy to right so now you know we're trying to find we're, we're getting all these leads and we're trying to narrow them down to the quality ones who are financially qualified and who are mentally qualified to buy in this market as well right you got it you got to take that approach uh, Emmanuel, were you going to add something? Uh, just really quick, you guys already kind of talked about it, but make this make these things a part of your script. You know, one thing that I say when I ask, um, it's an easy one. You know, how long have you been looking in the market? Have you sh have you viewed any properties yet? Have you submitted any offers? And if the answer is no, before you head out there, just have that conversation. That's an easy way in, right, to get that to have those questions with them. So, something small I wanted to add. Yeah, that's. I remember when, when I was working with buyers, that was, um, that was one of the questions I always, asked. I always asked, Hey, what has been your experience so far in terms of in a home? Have you looked at any homes? You know, did you go with an agent? Did you go to open houses? Have you submitted any offers on the homes? What do you guys think about the market? Right. And when you put it on them like that, they're going to give you all the answers. 
right? And then you're going to be able to tailor your conversation, you know, based off where they're at. And if they say, well, no, we've already submitted six or seven offers. You know, we're working with an agent. We're no longer working with them. Okay, guys. So you know that it's a competitive market, right? So you understand that, you know, this is the nature of the market. You understand that this is what it takes. And you want to make sure you cross that bridge before you go spending all this time freaking sent, you know, sending them homes and showing them homes only to arrive at, no, we're not ready for this, right? You're going to save yourself a ton of time, a ton of heartache, a ton of stress. And you're going to also be able to provide a higher level of service and value if you're just upfront and you set those expectations with the client, mm -hmm. you know, so. Um, and I think in terms of some other strategy, I, oh, go go ahead. Ahead. I think in terms of like asking hard questions, let's ask ourselves hard questions, right? Is it, is it a conversion issue with, with the tons of leads we have, or is it an organizational issue, right? Because I know like treat this as your business. I'm sure a lot of us uh, people in here, we've never had this many leads before. Right. So other than I think we're all good at scripts, we all have a mouthpiece. We all know how to talk to people. Right. Asking the right questions is definitely there, but it may also be an organizational thing. So I think we need to be self-aware and, and figure that out, because I know for me, it's somewhat of an organizational issue that I need to work on. So I'm sure I'm not the only one as well. Just staying yeah. on top of your leads, you know? Yeah, it's a combination of both. Right. It's a combination nation of making sure you're asking the right questions, you know, setting the right expectations and then being organized. That's just a whole nother and a whole nother factor to running a, a successful business. So you could be the bet, the person with the best conversations and the best presentation, but you're unorganized and you got stuff slipping through the cracks because you're just not following up. Right. So you have to have the balance of both of being able to organize your business and work on your business and spend time, you know, and understand why that's important. And then also get really good at the scripts, at the conversation, at mastering your skills, at your knowledge, so that when you do meet with people, you're able to give them the most value and have the most impact on that client. Uh, so it's a combination of both. Now, we're almost done. I'm just going to go down a couple little things because these will answer some of your questions that you guys put in there. And this is just some strategy for you guys. Um, so let's see. We talked about you know, people being unrealistic, right? So educate early on and establish buyer readiness, right? So take, keep, keep that in mind. You want to establish buyer readiness. Is this buyer ready to participate in this market? The only way you're going to know that is by educating them, having that dialogue, giving them examples of what's going on, being upfront with the market data in the initial presentation. So when you're doing your buyer presentation, you should be adding in, hey, what neighborhood are you looking to buy in? And maybe pull up the market stats, or maybe if you already know that neighborhood, start talking about what's happening in that neighborhood. Because when we're doing our buyer presentation, a lot of times we're just talking about the overall market, but we know each neighborhood is specific. So you may want to just ask that. I would include this in your, in your presentation. This is where you're now going a little deeper. Hey, buyer, you know, where do you want to live? Okay, I want to live in um, Santa Clara. Okay, great. Do you know anything about the Santa Clara market and how the, how the market is right now? A little bit. Okay, well, let's go into that real quick. I'm going to pull up the stat and kind of show you what's going on in the Santa Clara market because it's important that we understand this before we move forward. Um, is that okay? And then you're going to want to pull up the stats, pull up the MLS, you know, see what the inventory is like, see how much homes are selling over. These are all things that you have at your disposal, but you want to have these conversations and you want to establish buyer readiness, you know, and Mr. Customer being now that you know what's going on, how much over asking price these offers are doing and, you know, what the inventory situation is like, do you feel that you're ready to, you know, go compete in this market, you know, and, and go try to find the home. So it's real easy to ask those questions up front um, once you meet with them in your initial presentation. One of the reasons that was in that chat was inventory. There's not enough inventory, right? Can you control how much inventory there is? Yes and no, right? To a certain extent, you can't, right? But there are ways that you can go out and find opportunities. So this is now where you need to think outside the box and try to find other opportunities or off-market opportunities. Um, how many of you guys are using top agent network to see if there's listings coming up. Raise your hand. 
Okay, so if you didn't raise your hand and you're not using top agent network, you need to now add that into your arsenal. Because remember, we have a low inventory, right? So that needs to be part of what you do to find property. You have a client looking in Santa Clara up to 1.5 million. You need to go into top agent network. We pay for the account. I pay like 500 bucks a year to have that account. You need to go use it, right? You got to put in there, create a shirt, a search or whatever, and get alerted once a property comes up. You need to go a step further, right? If we know there's, if there's only three homes available in all of Santa Clara, you need to start going to your expireds, your canceled, start reaching out to those agents. Hey, I see you had this property listed last year. It looks like you guys canceled the listing. I have a buyer that's ready. They're looking in this neighborhood. Do you think your client is still open to, to selling their home? Right? Start looking for those opportunities. Um, going door knocking, right? When you're, we talked about this in our last, in the team meeting. If you're going to go show a home already, show up 10 minutes early, go knock on the three doors to the right and the three doors to the left right have your postcard or your flyer or your little handwritten letter already printed out hey i'm showing your neighbor's home my client's looking in this area they're well qualified there's not a lot of inventory chances are they won't get this home because there's too many offers this client wants to live on the street would you ever consider taking an offer on your home please call me at this number it could be a short little paragraph you print those out you already have them printed and you already have them in your car it could be just a generic letter right? It doesn't have to say the exact street, or you can even write the address on there if you want to write it. But just imagine now you do that every time you go show a home. And now you're talking to the three neighbors to the right, three neighbors to the left, All right? So this is now where we got to find, because we're not, you know, having a lot of inventory on the MLS, we got to go find and create that inventory for ourselves. Um, some of the things are like the husband and wife not being on the same page, you know, and they can't decide. I know I've ran into that before. This is why you got to have that conversation up front. You need to go deep on the criteria before showing more homes. You need to get laser focused. What are your must haves? What's, what can we compromise on? What homes should we not look at? What areas should we not look at? What can you compromise on? What are your must haves? Right? You have to have this conversation and you have to have it with both husband and wife if they're buying together. Because the last thing you want to do is go show homes that the wife doesn't like, but the husband does. They're not going to end up buying that home or vice versa. Right? So the more, the deeper you can go, right? Now we're talking about quality over quantity. The more effective you're going to be and the higher your conversion rate is, is going to go and the more clients you're going to get in contract. And you're going to weed out the ones that aren't that serious. Um, this is a strategy I know a, uh, Mitch was doing, getting the listing agent on the phone in front of the buyer to hear the feedback. Because when you're calling the client, remember, clients have a lot of distrust, right? Because they hear all these things in the news. They're skeptical. They don't want to overpay. So a lot of times when you're delivering news to someone, it depends how much trust they have with you, you know, whether they believe you 100%. But when you get the listing agent on the phone in front of them and you say, hey, how many offers do you have? And your client hears that directly from the listing agent's mouth on speakerphone, that is powerful, right? And now you can gauge, okay, do we want to participate or not? Um. The next point here, guys, is the bottom line is to get people to the offer table. You got to get their feet wet, right? Because there's theory, right? And then there's also application. Theory could be like, we're just talking about these things and we're explaining it to them, right? And yeah, you know, you can do a good job at explaining everything, but until they submit an offer and they actually see what it's like, if, especially if they've never submitted an offer before, they're not going to learn, right? Most people learn through experience, not through a textbook, right? So you got to get their feet wet and you got to give feedback to them, detailed feedback and let them learn the market. Uh, I'll get your question in a second, uh, Nestor. Um, one of the strategies I heard on a call was have your clients rate the homes on a scale of one to 10. And you want to establish this already before you go out. Hey, clients, when we go out and look at homes, we're going to grade them on a scale of one to 10. Anything that's a seven or higher, 
we should be submitting an offer on. If it's a seven or higher, that means it meets most of your needs. Uh, you know, it's in the right area, it's in your price range or whatever. Let's plan already to submit offers on anything that's a seven or higher or anything that's an eight or higher. Think about it like if you were to have this conversation up front before you even go out and look at homes, you're now setting the expectation that we're going to be writing offers if, we, if something meets a seven or an eight. Instead of like showing the homes and at the end, all right, guys, which one do you write, want to write an offer on or what do you guys think? This is now you're having a proactive approach like, hey, this is what has worked for us. Um. Cause you got to get people, you got to get people in the habit of like putting pen to paper, you know, or hitting the docu signs, getting them to, to write offers. This is something right here is there's a difference between being an aggressive agent, which can turn buyers off and being an agent that drives urgency because the market is moving so fast. And this is what you got to explain. You want to educate people. You want to show homes and then you want to drive urgency to submit offers because we know in this market, and this is something you got to tell your buyers directly, that the longer it takes for you to get in contract, the more expensive the home is going to be. So, Mr. Client, in my experience, we're in a market that's going up every single month. Homes are going up because there's a new comp being set. So we can do this the long way and you can end up paying a lot more or we can get really you know, strategic and really narrow it down and really sharpshoot on what we're trying to do and just know that the sooner we get in contract even if we have to pay a little bit more up front we're going to end up saving more money in the long run because interest rates may go up and the prices of homes are going up every single month time is money right now it's like it's like the uh it's like the stock market right or it's like the cryptocurrency right you can't be waiting for the thing to drop you got to just get in right? You got to get in and lock in at the current price, right? Because you know, it's going to go up later. Um, this is another thing here is understanding what the walk away price is for the buyer. What's your walk away price? Like if it goes higher than this, I will not pay a dollar more. Having that conversation up front. Hey, Mr. Client, based off the comps, based off the market activity, based off my discussion with the listing agent and how many offers they have, it's probably gonna go in this range, right? What's your walk away price, right? Where you won't pay another dollar. Um, and the last thing we talked about is just the distinction between met with customer and showing homes on the statuses. That's, we already covered that. But I want you guys to take some nuggets away, some takeaways from, you know, these strategies here on how to have these conversations and how to combat these issues in the marketplace. Um, Nestor, let's take your question and then we're going to wrap up. Oh, no, I was, I was raising my hand from, from earlier about using Top Agent Network. I didn't realize I had to click the button to lower it. My bad. Oh, okay. Okay. Guys, so, you know, we spent some time today going on a deeper level, right? Like we're doing all these great things on the surface, the foundation, we're getting people in the door, we're meeting with people. This, this is now, in order for us to, to, to take our numbers up, to increase our conversion, we have to shift gears now, right? We all have to step our game up now and we got to focus on quality. We got to focus on going deeper with these clients and having those conversations with them. You know, even if it's the uncomfortable conversations, but coming from a place of authority, coming from a place of an advisor role, coming from a place of a consultant and a market expert, right? And being able to speak confidently, you know, to these clients, uh, you know, so that ultimately they can make the best decision and you can eliminate wasting a bunch of time or having clients who are unrealistic. This is how you do it, right? You know, sometimes, you know, I've heard people, not necessarily on our team, but just in general, complain like, hey, these leads are not good, or I'm getting a bunch of bogus leads, or, you know, they're not quality, or a lot of people are unqualified. And really what it is, 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 is a lot of times we're not working the lead correctly. We're not asking the right questions, you know, and we're spending time on ones that probably aren't qualified. Um, 
because we're not going deep with these, right? So your job is, is to get the leads, is to pick them apart, ask the right questions to figure out where's the opportunity and where do I need to dedicate my time to, right? And if you do that, you'll see, guys, your business is only going to improve. You know, you, you're going to have to talk to a lot. You'll be working with less people because the ones you work, are working on are the strong, serious candidates, right? And in your life's going to be a lot easier. Any uh, final questions before we wrap up? I'm excited. Ready to make some money. Let's get it. Let's do it. Uh, let's get a little quick picture for the gram, my Zillow Flex squad. All right, guys. If you need anything, let me know. Happy hunting out there. Let's do it, guys. See you later. Later.